All right, Alexander, let's talk about what is going on in Ukraine. And the big news is Bakhmut, Artyomovsk. Is it liberated? Has it been taken by the Russians? Do, uh, do the Ukraine, does the Ukraine military still have it? It depends who you ask, to be quite honest. I mean, we know the, we know the truth, but the media narrative around Bakhmut is pretty, pretty interesting how they're approaching it, at least in the collective West. Anyway, what is the situation on the ground in Ukraine? Yeah, let's, let's start with the truth. The Russians captured Bakhmut on Saturday. They captured it entirely. Last, uh, uh, you know, building, cottage, whatever, in Bakhmut, they've captured it. That doesn't mean that there might not be a few Ukrainian stragglers hiding in various places in this town. But the Russians control it. And in fact, we've now got lots of pictures, photos of Russian soldiers in every single part of Bakhmut moving around quite openly. They're not afraid. They're not frightened. Clearly, the fighting there has ended. So there was a collapse of the remaining Ukrainian resistance on Saturday. Lots of videos of Ukrainian soldiers leaving Bakhmut, going across the fields to the west. My impression, by the way, is that they were ordered to leave. I don't think that this is just a, you know, panic-stricken soldiers deserting from Bakhmut. I think they, I think somebody gave them an order to go. They left, and the Russians occupied the rest of the town. So the Russians control Bakhmut, and there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt either that this big Ukrainian counteroffensive that we were hearing so much about over the last couple of days, week or so, 10 days or so, the one that was supposed to, um, you know, de-block Bakhmut, reverse the course of the fight there, that stalled. I mean, there's still fighting going on, but it's stalled. So that's the reality on the ground. The media in the West and in Ukraine is a complete mess. Now, you get one or two outlets, the Daily Telegraph, interestingly, in Britain that sort of grudgingly accept that Bakhmut has probably fallen. And even the Institute for the Study of War in Washington seems to be edging towards acknowledging that. They say, you know, the parts that have been captured are of no strategic significance, but that seems to concede that those parts have indeed been captured. But much of the media is in outright denial about this. And, of course, um, Zelensky typically is yo-yoing. So one moment he seems to admit that Bakhmut has indeed been captured. The next moment he denies it or seems to deny it, if you pass his words carefully, which perhaps is a pointless thing to do with someone like Zelensky, because Zelensky's words really are not very ever particularly well chosen, or so it seems to me. But anyway, his comments, he was criticised for admitting that Bakhmut had fallen in a conversation with Biden, which is reported by CNN. So he goes on to a press conference, says the Russians don't occupy it. And of course, the Ukrainians do are doing exactly the same thing they did after the fall of Solidar. They're still pretending that the fight there is underway. The Ukrainian general staff this morning are reporting that there is still battles going on. They don't make it clear, by the way, whether those battles are actually happening within Bakhmut or nearby or what exactly. But to somebody who hasn't been following this thing closely, it gives the impression that the Battle of Bakhmut is still underway. There is no doubt, let me repeat, repeat again, there is no doubt that it is captured by the Russians. The Russians control, as of now, the whole of Bakhmut. And, of course, the Russians are now telling us that we should stop calling it Bakhmut, but we should start calling it Artyomovsk, which is its Russian name, I think, for the purpose of this video, because we're still talking about the aftershocks of the battle. I'm going to stick to calling it Bakhmut, though I can foresee that we will be calling it Artyomovsk in the future. Yeah. Uh, why, why does the collective West media continue with this narrative that Bakhmut has not been taken by the by the Russians. When they know well, it I, has. I mean well, they, they know they it. 
course I, they do. I imagine Reuters knows the truth. Yes. Why yes. do they deceive? Why do they deceive? Because, of course, they have a major uh, um, narrative problem. Because, of course, for weeks, for months, they've been telling us, you know, this fortress Bakhmut expression that the Ukrainians themselves came up with. And um, that, you know, that the Russian offensive there was losing momentum. You've, I'm sure you've heard all of that. You remember hearing all of that. But then in particular, over the last um, two weeks or so, 10 days or so, they've been telling us a lot about this Ukrainian counterattack. And the Ukrainians were gaining ground in and around Bakhmut. If you read some of the, the reports that were published in the Western media, they gave the very strong impression that the Ukrainians were pushing the Russians back within Bakhmut itself, never mind what was going on in the flanks. So this was a narrative of Ukrainian advance that was being actively promoted, and it collapsed on Saturday. So they have a problem. How do you explain to people that a battle is lost when right up until the moment it's been lost, you've been telling them that it's about to be won. So you can understand that they have problems. Yeah. All right. So what's uh, next? We know the truth. We know that the Russians have, uh, have taken Bakhmut. They've captured Bakhmut. Bakhmut. They've liberated Artyomovsk, whatever you, uh, you would prefer to to call it, we know the reality. We know the truth. We're not in denial, like the collective West media. Yes. What comes next? Right. Well, I mean, the, first of all, we have to consider the possibility that the Ukrainians might try to launch some sort of counterattack to capture Bakhmut. I'm going to say that. I don't think anybody thinks that's a serious possibility, but it has been floated by some Russian officials, uh, a man called Marochko, who is a former lieutenant colonel of the Lugansk militia has said that, you know, there might be some people in Ukraine who are foolish enough to think that. So it may be that, you know, the, the Ukrainians will try to contest the Russian capture of the town. I have to say that at the moment, it all looks very quiet there. There's no real sign of any Ukrainian attack. I think what is going to happen is that once the Russians have fully consolidated control of Bakhmut, once they've cleared you know, whatever Ukrainian stragglers are still there, they will start to push west. Now, there's reports that they've captured a village called Kromovo, which is to the northwest of Bakhmut, a very heavily contested place. It was sits astride one of the roads that was leading into Bakhmut. I think what the Russians will want to do is that they'll want to capture the surrounding villages, the remaining surrounding villages, west of Bakhmut, that are still under Ukrainian control. One is Khromovo, which I've just mentioned. Another is a rather bigger place called Ivaniska, which is to the southwest, and which is apparently heavily fortified and surrounded by woods, which makes it difficult to capture. A further place is Bogdanovka, which is bigger still and could be called perhaps more than a village, perhaps a small town. And then I think they will want to take a place called Chasov Yar, which is the next small town west of Bakhmut. Now, I've been reading reports by Ukrainian soldiers, and this is, you know, going back, stretching back some time. And it seems quite clear to me that once these other villages, Khromovo, Bogdanovka, Ivanivska, are captured by the Russians, um, Chasov Yar itself is undefendable. It's small houses. It's not a big place at all. There's no natural defences that you could create there. And I think that once the Russians have captured Chasov Yar, probably they will want again to consolidate, but that will put them in a very, very strong position when they decide to move west towards the big town, of Kramatorsk, which is part of the Slavyansk, Kramatorsk conurbation, but I don't expect that to happen for several months. So I think they will want to tidy up the situation around Bakhmut first. They're also pressing very hard 
in two other places. There's been more reports from Avdeevka. Avdeevka is almost surrounded. In fact, Avdeevka in some ways is closer to being surrounded than Bakhmut was. If you look at the map, you can see it's sort of Russian positions. They, they, their, their pincers again are quite close to each other now. There's very heavy bombing in this place. Avdevka is important because it is so close to Donetsk city and the Ukrainians shell Donetsk city from Avdevka. So it's got symbolic as well as tactical importance. And so I think they'll want to sort that out over the next few weeks. And the other thing they probably will want to do at some point is deal with another town further north called Sivesk. Sivesk is a very small place, around 10,000 people. It was not captured by the Russians after they took Lizichansk back in the summer of last year. I think many people think that was a mistake. I think they feel that they should have, Russians should have concentrated on taking it. I think they will want to take that because once they've done that, then they can strengthen their positions in the north and that will bring them closer to Slavyansk, which is the northern part of this big conurbation, Kramatorsk in the south, Slavyansk in the north, where the Ukrainians will probably make their last stand in Donbass. So I think that's probably the Russian game plan, but it will probably work its way through, given the incremental way in which the Russians fight, over many weeks, probably months, and in the meantime, the force that captured Bakhmut, the key unit that captured Bakhmut, the Wagner organization and its fighters, they, they're going to be pulled back to the rear, they're going to be given time to rest and uh, reorganize and rebuild. Uh, Prigozhin says they'll be back by the end of June, which makes complete sense to me. So uh, that's, I think, what the Russian plan is. And, of course, the other thing they've got to do is that they've got to deal with this offensive that uh, um, the Ukrainians are talking about launching, most probably, in the south. So they want, I suspect, also to see that off first. So tidying up operations around Bakhmut in Donbass, defence in the south against this offensive, once the offensive is out of the way, repelled, as the Russians hope and expect, then in a few months' time, they can start to close in on Slavyansk and Kramatorsk, which is, as I said, the last big defense line. Right. So the Russians, they're going to be moving towards, uh, towards this direction west, slowly, slowly, in incremental uh, movements, as they have been doing throughout this this conflict, they've got the uh, in the south in Zaporozhye and Kherson. They've got to most likely, most likely defend against the the big uh, counteroffensive that Biden, by the way, talked about uh, as well. But um, we have the the new wonder weapon, which is also going to to come into play, and that is the F 16s As we have been saying on this channel for a while now. Uh, the F-16s will most certainly be delivered to the Ukraine military. And now we've got the, the news that they are being uh, delivered to the military. There's this four-month training course, which I don't think anyone believes it. The, the pilots from whatever country they are from, they have been in training for a while now in the United States. And they're going to be trained in Poland and Germany. And uh, this has been planned. This has been in in the planning stages for, I believe, for a, the better part of a year plus. Yes. Yes. And uh, that's going to be the, the new Wonder Weapon. We've gone yes. through javelins and HIMARS and drones and uh, leopard tanks and the Patriot system, which didn't last long as a Wonder Weapon. And now we're on what I believe to be the, the final Wonder Weapon. I mean, where do you go from F-16s? Where do you go well, from I, there? Well, I suppose you could sense... I mean, you either could NATO... Still... Yeah, go on. Well... Yeah. <laughs> You know, you either get NATO into the conflict directly or, I don't know, you, you go much, 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 much uh, further up on the escalation uh, escalator. <laughs> so, you know, I think this is this this is it. 
for yeah. me, at least in my opinion, this is the final big wonder weapon. Yeah, uh, at least a lot. as far as a proxy, as, at least as far as a proxy war is concerned. And uh, th this makes sense to me for the U.S. because the U.S. wants to fight a war in the air. It's what they understand. It's what they know. I think this 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 war of attrition is something that the U.S. and NATO they just they just can't fight it. They know they can't fight it. They know they're they're suffering heavy losses. They know the Russians are winning, and so the fact that they want to shift everything to uh, to a war that's being fought uh, in the air it does make sense for for the U.S. military. Absolutely. Can I just, before we, I get onto that, though, discuss Biden's comments, because I found them extremely interesting. Now, you, you've had Zelensky coming up with all kinds of reasons why the you, you've offensive has had to be postponed. And my strong impression listening to Biden is that Biden told Zelensky, my patience with you is exhausted. You are going to carry out your offensive. And I think that Zelensky actually gave him the date when um, it's going to be launched. And Biden said, you know, you are all the weapons you need. You've been provided with everything you uh, need to carry out this offensive. You have to carry out this offensive. So um, the Ukrainians are not happy about launching this offensive. Now, again, there's all these stories about Zeluzhny being wounded or dead. There's been reports about Sirsky being wounded or dead. I think what people don't know is there was actually a very brief video yesterday of Zeluzhny himself attending some kind of science event, which is probably intended to allay fears that he actually is dead. But it is the fact that he's disappeared from view for days. And Sirsky also, I mean, they published a video just now, apparently a short time ago, but people have been able to work out that that video was actually made on Thursday of last week. So, you know, these two people have gone to ground. They are not happy about being pushed into launching this counteroffensive. But the Biden team will not brook a refusal. They say, you've talked us into this. You've got all these tanks and all these infantry fighting vehicles on the strength of get, launching this offensive. U.S. taxpayers have paid for this or are paying for this. You must now launch this offensive. Now, I don't think anybody expects that this offensive is going to succeed. So as you absolutely rightly said, the F-16s are coming and they're going to come this year. I think this is a point people really want to understand. I mean, I know there's been a lot of talk that this is all intended for cut to come after the War is over and, you know, Schultz is saying Germany won't participate. Schultz has said things like that many times. And in the end, G Germany does participate. So these F-16s are coming this year. And as you rightly say, pilots have been trained. They may not all be Ukrainian, by the way. <laughs> I mean, you, you can get um, ex-pilots from all kinds of NATO countries. Now, as you absolutely rightly say, it is the kind of war that... The U.S. military understands artillery war, um, attrition war. This is a war completely different from any kind of war they have ever fought. It's entirely incomprehensible to them, and it makes them very uneasy, and they don't understand it. So, as you rightly said, it makes complete sense for them to try to move the war to the air. The trouble is that Russia is also strong in the air too. It has the most sophisticated air defence system in the world. It's got fighter jets like the Suhoi 35, and, which is apparently more than a match for the F-16. It's got uh, apparently increasing numbers of its fifth generation jet. Nobody knows quite how many, the Suhoi 57, the MiG-31, it's got secure base areas in Russia itself. It, it, this is an air war, but it's an air war which is also going to be very different from the one that the US Air Force has ever fought up to now, because every single air war that the United States has fought since Vietnam, the United States has had overwhelming air superiority. A situation 
where they are up against a peer air force equipped with fighter jets at least as advanced, in fact, arguably more advanced than the ones that they're committing to the battle, is completely new, new to them. And I suspect that, yes, it is what they want to happen. Definitely, it's what the Biden team wants to happen. I also suspect there are some people in the Air Force, the US Air Force, who are unhappy. And we're getting reports from all sorts of commentators, you know, former US Air Force commanders. They're saying, you know, the F-16 isn't the right weapon for this sort of war. It doesn't have any stealth capability. It's a 52-year-old design. Um, it's not really up to dealing with the latest top-of-the-line Russian fighter jets. Um, but what else do they have? All right, two, two final questions. Uh, is this why the, the new guy to take over from Milley for the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, the chairman, I, f I forgot his name, but Brown. he's an Air Force guy. He is, he is. he's Brown, Brown. General is, is Brown, that, yeah. Is, is the, yeah, is that why he was brought in? Uh, that's my first question. And my second question is, where is this, uh, this F-16 uh, war going to originate from? Where are all these fighter jets going to take off from? Well, this is an excellent that, question. That, that's that's own, a big deal. <laughs> it's a huge deal. My own view is Poland. I mean, I can't really see how they can operate from Ukraine. Apparently, there are problems with the F-16. Um, I mean, I'm not an expert on this as well uh, as on many other things. But again, I just say, people who know about this aircraft say that it has a very low slung engine. That means it needs extremely clean and secure runways. It's not going to get those in Ukraine. And that's putting aside all the issues of maintenance, logistics, infrastructure that you need to support an aircraft like this. So realistically... It has to be Poland, and that has two things. Firstly, there is a there is a, a military dimension because, of course, if the aircraft have to fly from Poland in order to reach the front lines, that's a very long distance. And the Russians have enormously powerful tracking radars; they'll be able to detect these aircraft. That will put these aircraft in a vulnerable position. That is one. But forget about that. The political dimensions of this are enormous. If you're carrying out, if you're carrying out air campaigns from a, the territory of a third country, if you're launching fighter jets from Poland in order to fight Russia over Ukraine, then whether or not you want to admit to the fact Poland is a participant, it's a party in the war. I think even international law, even interna in fact, I can definitely say that, international law would acknowledge that. So the Russians are then in a position to counter those aircraft by launching attacks on the bases in Poland. I'm not saying they would, by the way, but that's a right that they have and that they might do. Yeah, I wonder if this uh, if this is a way to draw Poland into the conflict. Possibly, um, I, I wonder if you know now that now that Sullivan has greenlit the the Ukraine military attacks on Crimea. I mean, yeah. he gave an interview on yeah. CNN. He said, um, you know, Walensky gave us assurances that Ukraine won't attack Russia, Russia proper, but absolutely attack Crimea. I mean, that was oh. pretty much what Sullivan yeah. said. Uh, I, 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 I should does, say, he has do, do, do said you, that before. Yeah, he has said yeah, that before. I know. I, I know, mean, but, this isn't particularly you, but anyway, carry on. I, I agree, but yeah. it seems like he's, he's more determined to, to get the point across, which leads it to my question. Do you think that perhaps this is a, a ploy to, to go to the Russians and say, look, the F-16s, they're going to be flying out of Poland, Romania, Slovakia, whatever. They're going to be flying out of there. But uh, you don't hit us and we won't hit Crimea. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. I doubt it. Uh, I, I doubt it. I think it's more likely something else, actually. It's, uh, it's uh, intended as a warning to the Russians. Look, you know, we want to get out of this thing. It's not turning out well for us. Um, um, so... This is your opportunity to sit down and talk, because, of course, if you don't talk, 
and agree to some kind of deal um, along the kind of lines that we want, well, then you'll be faced with the possibility of a larger war because we're going to have F-16s flying from Poland to Romania. And by the way, there are some Western officials who are already talking like that. that Poland it's to Ukraine. Way- Sorry, yeah, exactly. Poland, Poland to yes, Ukraine. Ukraine, Ukraine exactly. Ukraine. exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So the, the point is that um, it, 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 it's a it's a threat to escalate even further in a way that I think is intended to intimidate the Russians into agreeing to negotiations as a means of freezing the conflict. I think in this sort of complicated world that people like uh, Sullivan and co inhabit, I think this is partly. The thinking, and by the way, you could also argue that they need a failed offensive in some ways, not because they necessarily want the offensive to fail, but because they want the offensive to fail in order to justify accelerating forward the supply of the F-16s. Ukraine's about to collapse. It desperately needs F-16s, so let's supply them with F-16s. I don't think the Russians will be impressed by that. I have been following Russian commentaries very carefully. They are not afraid of the F-16. And I think that the Russians probably calculate that they can deal with this problem of the F-16. They won't even need to attack the bases in Poland. Whether you know that holds is another matter. But I think that the Russians will not be impressed. They will not be concerned, after all. Russian proxies, like the North Vietnamese, for example, advanced against um, air forces equipped with American planes. I think the Russians believe their air force can handle whatever the F-16 does to them. And I don't think they're concerned about it. So I think that's probably the actual thinking in Moscow. I think they're going to their plan is to continue the attrition war. It's turning out well for them and that they're going to call the American bluff. So I think that's probably the game that's been played with the F-16s. I think that even in the US, they don't really expect the F-16 to change the whole situation. But they're basically saying to the Russians, look, if you don't back off, if they continue the way you're going, if you don't agree to freeze the conflict, then you'll be up against the F-16s and will be striking at Crimea as well and doing all of those things. But as I said, I don't think the Russians are going to pay much attention. I mean, you mentioned all the various super weapons. One of them that you didn't mention was the Storm Shadow missile that the British have supplied, which is going to be the substitute from the attackers. Um, if you believe Russian reports, which, by the way, I do, they're being shot out of the skies you know, about, you know, in, in, in large numbers now, they're making no impact at all. And I think the Russians feel the same way about the F-16. Yeah. yeah, and of course, you could always take, just to wrap up the video, you can always take a, a, a much more cynical view of things and say that, that the military industrial complex is, is just saying, you know, let's just get rid of these F-16s so we can move on, get every country that, uh, that hasn't yet, get them on board with the... Uh, the F-35s. So exactly. this is a good excuse exactly. for the MIC to, to make a lot of money. If there's one, if there's one yeah. weapon that makes them a lot of money, it's, it's the fighter it's jets. It's the F-35. Yeah. And, and please bear in mind, you asked about General Brown. I think General Brown is terribly interested in Ukraine. I've been going over his various comments. He's not said very much about it. He is monomaniacally focused on China. That's my own impression. But... He is a huge advocate of the F-35. He's been the single most forceful supporter of the F-35 programme. He wants, for example, to take the A-10 Thunderbolt, this ground attack subsonic aircraft, out of service and replace it with the F-35. He wants basically the entire US Air Force, as far as I can see, to transition to the F-35. And he will be pushing very hard for NATO member states to do the same. So get rid of your F-16s, buy the F-35s. Uh, um, is it Boeing? I can't remember which one of the part of the MIC uh, makes the F-35. Lucky they'll be very Biden. happy. Yeah. yeah, they'll be very, very happy. And uh, um, lots of money, lots of contracts. Everybody will be very happy. And, you know, we'll be able to get rid of all of these old F-16s lying, over, lying around from the Cold War and after. We'll be able to get our new flashy... Uh, <laughs> stealthy 
F-35s, which are, you know, these new miracle weapons that are joining the Air Force and which cost all these enormous amount of money each. So I think, you know, that you, you, to go back to General Brown, I suspect that's his agenda. Yeah. You know, give, give the F-16s to Ukraine. If you're the MIC, you say whatever. If Ukraine, if Ukraine happens to do something uh, in, in this conflict, great. Most likely not. But you say, okay, whatever. Let them do whatever they're going to do. If they have success, if you're the MIC, great. If they don't, that's also great because you're you're still making money. I mean, I mean they, they, they win no matter what. Well, of course yeah, they, they do because they I mean, no I, I know. I know the argument people make that you know, the U.S. still exports F-16s and a failure of the F-16s in uh, Ukraine is going to be uh, bad for their exports. But that completely misses the point, in my opinion, which is that they don't want to export F-16s. They want people to buy F-35s. And the major market is Europe. So they will want to get the Europeans to buy in in the F-35. So they say, well, F-16, great fighter jet, did amazing things in the past, was absolutely cutting edge in the 70s. But as we have seen, it's not up to the latest fighter jets that the Russians have. You need the F-35 to counter those. So Germany, <laughs> Italy, the Netherlands, all of these countries transition to the F-35. Typhoon isn't good enough. The F-35 is the one. So that's, I think, the sales pitch you're going to be seeing over the next few years. Yeah. All right. Vidaran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, Pitch, Shoot, Telegram, and Rockfin. And go to the Duran shop. 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.